Good evening. My name is Matt Baker. I'm one of the assistant professors of anesthesiology at the UK Department of Anesthesiology. And tonight I'd like to speak with you about upper extremity regional anesthetics, uh, in particular those that can be performed with the use of ultrasound. Before uh, we launch into that, I'd like to present a series of questions that I think highlight some of the important considerations that should be undertaken before a regional anesthetic technique is selected. Um, although some of these uh, responses are somewhat flippant and uh, the answer should be fairly obvious, um, I think they do bring important points to bear. Uh, for instance, a 35-year-old man presenting for rotator cuff repair who has liver disease and an elevated INR. Um, the issue uh, at hand is how to proceed with regional techniques in patients that have a bleeding diathesis, whether it's due to antiplatelet or anticoagulant medications or liver failure. Um, the American Society of Regional Anesthesia has created guidelines on how to uh, approach regional techniques in this patient population. And those guidelines are updated fairly regularly. Although it's beyond the scope of discussion in this particular lecture, I recommend that if you have questions, you consult the website of the American Society of Regional Anesthesia. The second uh, question um, is another important point. Uh, it involves an elderly obese woman who has COPD and obstructive sleep apnea who presents for total shoulder arthroplasty. As we'll discuss later, um, an interscaling block, which ordinarily would be a wonderful choice for regional anesthesia in this particular patient, might be problematic because of potential diaphragmatic impairment from the block in somebody who already has respiratory disease. As I'm sure you will find out if you have not already, uh, clinical medicine, at least in this day and age and at this institution, is uh, something that has to uh, deal with um, suboptimal uh, conditions. And uh, sometimes choices have to be made uh, where there is no perfect answer and uh, the lesser of two evils, so to speak, um, must be undertaken. Another question brings to mind uh, interactions with other members of the care team whose needs uh, should be considered and although uh, they may um, result in you performing regional techniques that are not to your satisfaction, uh, it is important to remember that there are other people that uh, have needs that you must um, compromise with and uh, find a common solution to. And uh, an orthopedic surgeon getting ready to operate on a patient whose neurologic status he uh, needs to assess post-operatively is a good example. Do you do the block preoperatively, in which case he would not be able to assess the neurologic function of his patients? Uh, do you do it post-operatively and submit the patient to uh, probably large amounts of opioids and the associated side effects that would otherwise be spared with a regional anesthetic. Uh, these are considerations that uh, need to be made. This final uh, question I think again is an important one and uh, at least for me uh, anytime I think about performing a regional technique I think about the reason I'm doing it. And uh, to be more precise, there are two kinds of blocks in my mind uh, that are common. One is a so-called analgesic block, uh, whose primary goal uh, is to provide pain control for after surgery or after traumatic event. Um, in this case, the only nerves that need to be blocked are sensory nerves and any motor involvement uh, is unnecessary. Uh, 
However, for surgical blocks, in which the uh, regional block is intended to be the primary anesthetic for a, a surgical case, it's important to block not just sensory but also motor fibers. And so so-called surgical blocks of necessity need to be denser blocks. When performing uh, regional techniques, the two most common uh, methodologies for doing so are ultrasound and nerve stimulator techniques. Uh, in years gone by, the most common was nerve stimulator techniques before ultrasound became more accessible and available. The idea with nerve stimulator techniques is that an electric current is provided through a needle uh, intended for the block. Um, when the needle approaches the intended neurologic target, if the nerve is somatosensory, you should expect to see a corresponding uh, muscle twitch of the muscle innervated by the nerve fibers you are trying to block. So for instance, on a sciatic block, you might expect to see gastrocnemius uh, twitching. Um, for various reasons, uh, nerve stimulator techniques are becoming uh, less commonly used as the primary technique for performing regional anesthetics. Um, and ultrasound has supplanted that. We'll get into why in a second. There are multiple advantages for ultrasound. Um, there is a suggestion that the time to block performance is decreased, that the failure rate is decreased, that less total local anesthetic is needed to perform the block, and therefore patients should be, at least in theory, at less risk of local anesthetic systemic toxicity. Um, there is the thought that perhaps ultrasound provides for longer duration and more dense blocks, and perhaps also helps us avoid injuring nerves during block placement. However, there are some drawbacks to ultrasound as well. It's a very expensive technology. Um, it's continuously updated, and for people who use it infrequently, may be difficult to stay current with. Um, it is also uh, known that ultrasound in and of itself does not necessarily prevent complications from block performance. Again, we'll get into why that is in a little bit. Most importantly is that there's a relatively steep learning curve with ultrasound. Uh, the mere ability to image a structure or set of structures does not necessarily uh, correlate to increased block success because one's ability to utilize and interpret the image acquired is something uh, that takes experience and time and uh, merely attaining an image uh, does not necessarily uh, make one uh, able to interpret it and use it to accomplish uh, the goals of nerve blockade. Uh, the actual ultrasound used for nerve block is relatively immaterial and is due mostly to availability and provider preference. More importantly is the probe that's selected for regional techniques. In general, the smaller the probe, the higher the frequency of the uh, emitted ultrasound beam, and the uh, shallower the depth capable of being imaged. So the smaller probes, although they provide clearer pictures in general, cannot image structures that are deep. And so for deeper structures, such as the sciatic nerve, it may be preferable to use a larger probe than it would be for a more superficial nerve block, such as a supraclavicular block. I'm sure you probably are somewhat familiar with ultrasound, and although I'm not going to get into details, it is important to understand 
uh, different structures appear differently uh, with ultrasound. Um, the more dense the structure in general, the more white it appears on ultrasound, the more dense it is, such as bones and neurologic structures, tendons, and ligaments. Um, structures that are not as dense, such as muscle tissue uh, and blood vessels, tend to appear more hypoechoic or dark. It's important to remember that uh, because, uh, in general, nerves will appear uh, fairly hyperechoic, with few exceptions. Another way uh, under ultrasound to help delineate a nerve structure from another structure is that most nerve structures have hyperechoic rims but also have multiple septations almost in a honeycombing pattern uh, where each of the hyperechoic lines represent fascial sheaths and each of the uh, darker hypoechoic round structures uh, represent actual nerve fascicles. It's relatively common to see this pattern uh, when imaging nerves. On the other hand, uh, such as is seen over to the left of the screen, most vascular structures, which nerves can sometimes be confused for, tend to have a hyperechoic rim and a homogeneously hypoechoic center. Here's an example of potential problems uh, for nerve blockade in somebody who's unfamiliar with uh, this particular approach. In this image, we have what is a very clear picture of the interscaling approach to the brachial plexus. The brachial plexus is listed uh, with ends and arrows point towards them. These nerve structures have hyperechoic rims and, much like the blood vessels close by, are homogeneously hypoechoic in the center. Off to the left of the screen, you see the internal jugular vein and the carotid artery. Both of these are also uh, consistent with hyperechoic rims and homogeneously hypoechoic centers. You can see how it may be easy to confuse these nerve structures for vascular structures. And this is one of the reasons why simply being able to attain an image does not necessarily lead to improved block outcomes and efficiency. You have to be able to interpret the image in order to block the appropriate structure. When performing blocks, there are two major techniques uh, for imaging. One is the so-called out-of-plane technique, where the needle is introduced at a 90-degree angle perpendicular to the ultrasound beam. And as you can see in the image to the right of the screen, only a small cross-section of the needle can be imaged. The NT, or needle tip, is uh, imaged uh, in the picture uh, on the right side of the screen. The problem, in my opinion, with this approach is that it's uh, not definite what part of the needle is being imaged. So although NT suggests that the needle tip is what is being imaged, um, the needle anywhere up or down the shaft uh, in actuality may be imaged. This is one of the reasons why um, use of ultrasound is not necessarily lead to decreased complications. Because you cannot see the entire trajectory of the needle with this approach, it's possible that somewhere between the needle insertion site and the needle's image on the ultrasound beam, the needle has transgressed a vascular structure or a nerve structure that the provider would not know about because the provider cannot see. That's why when I perform regional blocks, I prefer the in-plane technique in which the needle can be imaged in its entirety from its penetration through the skin surface to its termination at the block target. Any vascular nerve structures or any other tissues uh, 
uh, that may be in the way uh, can be imaged and the needle can be adjusted and moved around these structures to avoid injuring them. The upper extremity blocks we will discuss today are those that are the most amenable to a blockade with the use of ultrasound and include uh, the interscalene, supraclavicular, infraclavicular, axillary, and digital approach to blockade of the brachial plexus. When we speak about blockade of the upper extremity, in general, we uh, aim to block part or all of the brachial plexus. The dermatomal distribution of the upper extremity, as you can see in this image, uh, consists of innervation from uh, cervical spinal roots for the most part with contribution from uh, some thoracic roots as well. Although this image is one that is probably very familiar to most of the viewers, uh, it is relatively uh, clinically unimportant unless the patient uh, intended to be blocked is suffering from some sort of spinal cord disease or an injury to the spinal cord or uh, nerve roots very close to the spinal cord. In practice, the more useful uh, map of innervation of the upper extremity is this one, which details the innervation of the terminal nerves that supply innervation to the upper extremity. These terminal nerves receive uh, input from numerous uh, spinal cord roots from various levels, but when testing block effectiveness or looking for uh, assessing a failed block to see what part of the brachial plexus was missed in the original block, it's more helpful to know the terminal nerve distributions as listed here. The brachial plexus blockade provides blockade to all the nerves listed here with the exception of the intercostobrachial and medial cutaneous nerves, which receive innervation from the first two thoracic uh, spinal cord uh, roots. Um, and therefore, when a uh, blockade of the brachial plexus is undertaken, unless another block is performed, the uh, nerves labeled medial cutaneous and intercostobrachial will be missed. This is important for surgeries on the upper arm or when a tourniquet is applied for surgery on the lower arm because it is easy to misconstrue a quote-unquote failed block for an incomplete block. In order to block the intercostobrachial and medial cutaneous nerves, a field block must be performed with local anesthetic injected subcutaneously as these nerves are very superficial and very small. They are not amenable to imaging with ultrasound because of their size, uh, but would be covered with a uh, field block. The brachial plexus, as you can see, is a very complicated structure formed by nerve roots from various levels of the spinal cord that are interwoven in a very complex fashion. There is some contribution from T1, although it is relatively minimal. Um, at various levels of the brachial plexus, uh, various blocks can be performed. The interscaling block is typically performed at the level of the roots. The supraclavicular block is typically performed at the level, <coughs> excuse me, level of the divisions. The infraclavicular block is typically performed at the level of the cords. The axillary block is typically performed at the level of the uh, terminal nerves or nerve branches. Although uh, the brachial plexus uh, is spread out over a relatively small anatomic area, uh, it does appear quite different uh, with each of these different block approaches which is why we'll take a close look at each one of them. Another uh, image of the brachial plexus. Uh, 
The interscaling block, as mentioned before, is typically undertaken at the root section of the brachial plexus. It usually misses the ulnar distribution because it typically covers only the C5, 6, and 7 nerve roots and misses C8 and T1, which provide the majority of innervation to the ulnar nerve. It almost always causes an ipsilateral phrenic nerve block because of the proximity of the phrenic nerve to the C5, 6, and 7 roots. The brachial plexus at this level emerges between the anterior and middle scalene muscles. The phrenic nerve lies on the belly of the anterior scalene muscle. When performing this block, uh, the probe placement can be assisted by use of anatomic landmarks. In this case, uh, the provider has taken the liberty of sketching out some anatomy on this patient's skin surface. Um, the brachial plexus should emerge behind the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle between the anterior and middle scalene muscles. This typically occurs at the level where the external jugular vein passes over the sternocleidomastoid or at the C6 level and so the cricoid cartilage sometimes serves as a guide for how far up or down the neck the probe should be placed. Imaging of the brachial plexus at this level reveals the so-called snowman sign where the C5, 6, and 7 roots are imaged one on top of the other and are labeled N with an arrow pointed towards them in this photograph. More medially we have the large vascular structures, the carotid artery and internal jugular vein. Although it cannot be seen due to its small size, the phrenic nerve again lies on the anterior surface of the anterior scalene muscle. Here the uh, provider has taken the liberty of outlining the structures that should be imaged when performing this block. This is another view of the brachial plexus and shows the complex twisting, turning, dipping, dodging, and diving that the plexus undertakes in its course towards the upper extremity. One of the important landmarks when performing blocks at the following levels, supraclavicular, infraclavicular, and axillary, is the large artery that supplies the upper extremity. It is a branch of the innominate artery and is called the subclavian artery until it passes beyond the lateral border of the first rib when its name becomes the axillary artery. When performing a supraclavicular block, uh, it's important to image the subclavian vessel. We'll see that in a second. The supraclavicular block, although close in proximity to the interscalene block, is uh, quite different in appearance from the interscalene. Again, we're blocking the plexus at the level of the divisions, and at this approach, we're very close to the pleura. And so in years past, prior to the common use of ultrasound for this block now, uh, there was a relatively high incidence of pneumothorax. Here is a picture of the brachial plexus at the level of the divisions as it hugs the subclavian artery over the first rib. In years gone by, this is the technique that was used. Essentially, um, the lateral border of the clavicle was appreciated, and a needle was used in a so-called plumbob approach, where the needle was held by the catheter, and gravity uh, oriented it towards the ground in such a way that it mimicked the dotted line of this image. And if the needle was inserted 
directly superior to the clavicle and straight down would, at least in theory, contact the brachial plexus. However, as mentioned, you can see at this level, the brachial plexus is very close to the lung and the subclavian artery. So it doesn't take much imagination to see how a pneumothorax would have resulted from this block. This is how the supraclavicular block is approached with the use of ultrasound using the in-plane technique. Again, the clavicle is identified and in this image is outlined in purple. The probe is placed immediately posterior to the clavicle and the needle introduced lateral to the probe. The subclavian artery is imaged. Underneath it is the first rib and beyond it the pleura of the lung. The brachial plexus, although it's somewhat hard to see in this image, is, uh, appears in what we call a cluster of grapes. Uh, as mentioned previously, there is a hyperechoic rim with numerous septations that uh, divide hypoechoic areas. Um, this block is safer because you can see if the needle is introduced in plane from the lateral border or the left, or excuse me, right side of the image, uh, should the needle be inserted too far, the first rib serves as a barrier to the lung. And so pneumothorax risk is greatly decreased with the use of ultrasound for this particular block. These are some other images of the supraclavicular approach to the brachial plexus. You can see the yellow area arrows in the image on top outline the brachial plexus, which again uh, appears as a cluster of grapes. That is to say, hyperechoic rim with numerous septations that divide off hypoechoic areas that is in very close proximity to both the first rib and the subclavian artery. The infraclavicular block is a block that blocks a similar distribution to that of the supraclavicular block and is probably better to anchor catheters because of the muscle tissue available to do so. In this case we block the brachial plexus at the level of the cords. In my opinion this is a more technically difficult block to perform than the supraclavicular and I'll show you why in a second. The external anatomy um, when deciding where to place the probe is similar to that of the supraclavicular approach. Uh, the clavicle should be identified and closer to the structure labeled 1, the coracoid process should be palpated and the probe should be placed immediately medial to the coracoid process and immediately uh, inferior to the clavicle. The needle should be oriented between the clavicle and the probe. Again, I'll show you an image of how that should be done shortly. And the needle should be directed in a posterior, lateral, and inferior angle to avoid any potential transgression of the lung. If the needle is inserted in such a fashion, if it is inserted too far, it will enter the true axilla and not risk causing a pneumothorax. An image of the brachial plexus at the level of the cords. You can see here the ultrasound probe is placed medial to the coracoid process and below the clavicle. The needle is introduced between the clavicle and the probe. In my experience, the needle has to be inserted at a much sharper angle than is shown in the images, and therefore it's harder to appreciate the needle when it is advanced with the ultrasound probe. Here we have an image that should greet you when you lay the probe in the appropriate position. The first structure that should be noted is the pectoralis major muscle followed by the pectoralis minor muscle, and then the axillary artery and vein. Uh, 
The brachial plexus, again, is at the level of the chords, and there should be three chords that are appreciated. The posterior chord, which should be at 6 o'clock to the axillary artery, as imaged. The lateral chord, which should be at about 9 or 10 o'clock to the axillary artery, as imaged. And the medial chord, which is usually at the 3 or 4 o'clock position of the axillary artery, as imaged. Sometimes it is difficult to delineate the chords, and so when I use ultrasound with this block, I tend to pair it with a nerve stimulator to give an extra uh, added level of um, ability to detect where the needle tip is when it is advanced. Here again, the provider has taken the liberty of outlining the relevant structures. You can imagine that the clavicle would be near the upper left corner of the image where the green dot appears and the needle would be inserted uh, from the upper left corner of the picture in a sharp angle with the tip terminating near the posterior cord. Ideally in this position when local anesthetic is injected, it should spread equally to the right and to the left of the posterior cord and numb the lateral and the medial cords. The axillary block is an important block because it's easy to perform and is commonly performed. It uh, involves blockade of the terminal nerves or branches of the brachial plexus. However, as mentioned before, separate field blocks of the medial brachial cutaneous and intercostal brachial nerves need to be undertaken because these nerves derive their innervation from sources other than the brachial plexus. In addition, the musculocutaneous nerve must be blocked separately because this nerve has already branched off the brachial plexus more proximally and if not blocked separately, uh, will not be blocked with blockade of the uh, other nerves. This represents good patient positioning for this particular block. The patient has their arm abducted and rotated with the hand upwards. The axillary artery can be palpated and appreciated close to the axilla. This is another image of the brachial plexus at the level of the axillary artery using the axillary approach. Here's a cross section of what you may expect to see when imaging it with ultrasound. <clears throat> the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm uh, is represented uh, very superficially because that's where it's found. However, in this image, it appears to be equivalent in size to the other branches of the brachial plexus, the ulnar nerve, radial nerve, and median nerve. Um, in reality, that's not true. The medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm is too small to image separately. You can see the probe is positioned uh, with the axillary artery centered in the ultrasound beam. The needle is inserted uh, anteriorly and directed posteriorly. Um, the nerves are very superficial and you can see the median nerve, ulnar nerve, and radial nerve as outlined in the image to the right. There's a high degree of variability of where these nerves are found around the axillary artery, though all of them closely approximate the artery. Off to the left of the image at the right, under the word biceps, you can see what appears to be a fascial line that almost underlines the word biceps. And then under it, uh, another fascial line. If you look carefully, although very long and thin, almost in a spindle shape, you can see what appears to be hypoechoic areas separated by hyperechoic septations. That represents the musculocutaneous nerve, which lies in the belly of the caracobrachialis muscle.
I insert this slide to show that the terminal nerves, axillary, median, and radial can be followed down with ultrasound from the axillary approach all the way to the wrist, if so desired, and anywhere along that course they can be blocked. The imaging becomes more difficult the closer to the wrist you get because the tendons and ligaments appear very similar to the nerves at this level. Here's an example. The nerve structure is labeled with the yellow arrow. As mentioned before, you can see muscle, or excuse me, nerve fascicles, hypoechoic areas separated, separated by hyperechoic lines. However, that does appear very similar to the flexor palmaris longus tendon, or FPL, which is listed immediately adjacent to the nerve. And you might understand why it would be difficult to delineate which structure is the nerve uh, just by imaging, which is one reason why in the image to the left, the provider is using what appears to be a nerve stimulator to help confirm needle placement and blockade of the appropriate structure. Digital blockade represents the most distal block of the brachial plexus that would ordinarily be undertaken. Uh, ultrasound is not necessary for this particular block. Um, of note, epinephrine should not be added because of the potential for vasoconstriction of terminal blood vessels in the digit and the risk for ischemia of the digit. You can see that for blockade of a given digit, uh, two insertions are required on the lateral and medial aspects of the digit near the metocarpophalangeal joint. The cross section of the digit explains why this is necessary. A small gauge needle is inserted uh, both lateral and medial to the digit and advanced down the sides of the digit. Blockade of both the palmar and dorsal digital nerves should be performed. Uh, this is what amounts to a field block as the nerves at this level uh, are too small to image. That concludes the presentation. Thank you.